Hello, my name is Valadonna Stofiel and I'm 13. I helped co-found Stofiel Aerospace when I was only five years old. Right now, we still own 73% of our company and Elon Musk owns less than 15%. <laughs> Three generations of the Stofield family have joined together to present an image of the future from an early adopter's point of view, and I didn't know how much work it would be. My business is a part of me, and I to it. What started out as a project to me and my dad turned into so much bigger. It is now a family. Stofield Aerospace is not a mining company. It's not a colonization company. It's not even a rocket company. We are a technological commercialization company. Motorcycle garage engineers built the aviation. They were bringing the rocket technology, we are bringing the rocket technology back to the bikers. They showed us an early on do-it-yourself attitude in their everyday work. And now you should show that in your everyday work. Being a startup company is hard. Even though we've only been doing this for four years, it definitely gets harder financially. But that's why we've been printing and starting to mass market, sell our heat shields for motorcycles. It keeps us in the black. We are taking the technology Spaceflight teaches us and directly applying it to the mass market. Using Hermes, which has a lock and go Using Hermes, which has a lock and go propulsion, we can launch from almost anywhere. And using that rocket, we are establishing a Yankee Clipper model of the Earth planetary economy with the Hyperion space plane, which means you're using a multi stage supply route and all those technological advances. All those terrestrial products can be put into the mass market. Motorcycles are the first early adopters we have targeted, as well as the race car and the classic car markets for our new ceramic process. Four years as of business, we have been working on the Hermes <coughs> rocket. Our rocket, Hermes, is part of our raccoon small satellite launcher, Boreas. Boreas takes Hermes and floats it up, floats it up to 100,000 feet. Then Hermes is shot up into low Earth orbit deploys its payload, and burns up during re-entry. No debris involved, this is a completely renewable resource. We have tested and fired 38 3D printed ceramic rockets and hover tested four. In 100 years, a lot of stuff is going to change in Stofield Aerospace. First, we start out as a commercialization company. And as the business progresses, we can use that profit profile to fund any exploratory ex <coughs> expeditions. For example, I want to be able to explore Enceladus and even Titan. I believe that there is life in the Saturn system and that there is water on Enceladus and Titan. That could mean a lot for our business. For example, by commercializing the study of life, we can admit we could advance medical science beyond this world. We literally don't know what we don't know yet. Making the unknown a product to the mass market by turning the unknown into a commodity, we can outperform NASA and the old guard by bringing technological and scientific discoveries directly to the general public. Working up to that goal is going to be hard, but what's a challenge without being challenged? So, all of the team, including the 85-year-old Mercury and Gemini engineers, will be working hard to this goal. When you spend $1 in space flight, it's said that you get $4 back in R&D science. We believe it's $400 back. This allows us to leverage what we learned from the rocket and produce terrestrial revenue. Commercialization space flight technology to a mass market as our main goal, we can self-finance expeditions to discover a generalization of what the unknown holds and quantify it as business ventures and commoditize the unknown. This is not business as usual, but a new outlook on what exploration economy means. New space making everyone's life better. Now, what will you do in space? A $2 million investment 
$2 million investment is seed money to bring us to an orbital milestone. The, exer the exit is a Series A. At a $4 million Series A, the exit is commercial orbital operations, which means after we go to orbit, we will buy you out. We are open to other I options, but in no way am I going to sell off my company. Ad Astra, poor Totaz, everyone is going somewhere. Everyone will benefit. Everyone deserves to see the glory of the universe. And you are that link to ensure that future. Because Stofield Aerospace isn't about me or my dad anymore. It's about you, you, and you. In May, we closed our unaccredited investor round for friends and family. We are now ready to take a seed round investment of $2 million on minimum. We are using this capital raise to accomplish orbital operations and fully market ability of IP. Oh, and we have revenue because raising money isn't a business plan. Thank you. So my first question is probably nowhere near the most important one, but I was curious what you had on the early slides about a non-GPS location service you were working on. What? That's a little technical. I mean, <laughs> I'll take that out. Um, I'm Brian Stofield. I'm her dad, and she's my boss. Uh, this the one? Non, non, the non-GPS system is designed so that we cannot be interfered with by military operations. Specifically, it's a uh, coming out of the electronic warfare uh, experience of mine, it's a radar warning receiver. So it's multiple antennas pointing towards a transmitter on the ground. Uh, and we've got, mul we've got hundreds if not thousands around the world already that have digital timing signals embedded in them. And they're called AM transmitters, all right? <laughs> AM radio stations. And these, these are huge power sources. I mean, 1,100 watts out of uh, uh, Cleveland. You can see them almost halfway around the world. And that's what we're, we're dealing with. That's one of the products we're going to commercialize to the, the mass market. Have you spent any time looking for, uh, I mean, it sounds like you have a background in the security world. Have you talked to them about this or gone for SBIRs or anything like that? Uh, we've actually applied for an SBIR and we consider government grants a waste of our time uh, and a waste of our money because according to the government accounting office, less than 15% of SBIRs actually go to small businesses. Most of them go to venture capital backed and Boeing's considered a small business. <laughs> so they're a waste of our time. We spent $8,000 in 2016 with a zero return on it. Got it. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit more about some of your revenue producing uh, ceramics and things that you're tell already we just, selling? Tell me what we just sold. Um, we just sold... $10,000. Oh, we just sold a $10,000 heat shield to... What was Ducati. It? Ducati. Motorcycles. Motorcycles, which was a big step for us. So the motorcycle industry is the early adopter industry. We, we targeted really with this ceramic process and the hot rod industry. These guys, they don't care what it looks like, they care if it works. And they care how to, real quickly. Does it make me faster? Does it make me better? I don't care about anything else, the race car guys. So these are the early adopters we went after. Um, every piece of the IP of the rocket, there's 20 on the ro 20 uh, patents on the rocket, four of them, two patent pendings, and two of them went in on July 3rd. Uh, we're gonna commercialize every one of those aspects. And the way we're going to do that is we'll go file the patent in the open patent office and make the government classify my patent. And if they don't classify the patent there, they pretty much don't have an option anymore. So that, that's the first application. Congratulations on your very imaginative early revenue opportunity that you secured. I just commend you for that. The, um, the ceramics and 3D printing your, your rocket what kind of integrity uh, levels do you have to achieve to make this feasible? Tell about tolerances. One out of every ten. 
So th this is a tolerance really issue more. Um, what we're really doing right now is going through the materials development to see where our tolerances levels are. We know that the rocket works up to hypersonic with the ceramic because we've static fired that already. Uh, we have some customers that want to do it for structural reasons, to lighten up metal structures, right? That we haven't gotten to yet, and that's what we're going to need independent verification for. That's what the industry requires. And that's usually about a $50,000 or three-month process to get that independent verification. Are there other, other examples of the ceramics being used in a, rel in a related way? Yes. Um, so I got a 1993 Firebird, big old eight-cylinder V8, right? And the thing's loud. So what we've developed is a variable back pressure exhaust, which we couldn't have done in metal. And the way to think about it is golf ball divots on the inside of the pipe. So at low Reynolds number, it starts canceling out the, the, the high frequency vibration. As you come up to above half throttle, the noise comes back and your Reynolds number goes up and now you've got a zero back pressure exhaust system. So exhaust systems are a big part of this because of the heat issues. Um, there's some uh, power plant issue that we can apply it to also. Uh, but really that exhaust pipe on that motorcycle, everybody's burned their legs and that's the low hanging fruit. But there are a lot of applications inside the thermal conductivity market that we're looking at. And on the Firebird, we prototyped it for about a month and we blew through like three before we actually got one working. And it, that's what you have to do. You have to take fails and learn from your um, failures. And then that's what we did and we now have a, one that actually works. I, I actually drove my motorcycle 8,000 miles coast to coast testing our ceramic heat shields. Very impressive. Obviously, you are a creative thinker and a game changer, and um, thank you for that. How do you expect to scale up and build a team to run a company and take over a market? So what we're, what we're actually doing is I'm not, I'm not the CEO. I'm just taking the CEO position for the time being. One of the big things is our sea level we want to replace. I need to be in the laboratory. I don't need to be up here on the stage, right? Um, so what we've got is we've, we've hired Ken Sunshine CFO. He used to be Virgin Galactic CFO. He used to be Vector CFO. He's now my CFO. Uh, we've got Ken Hoagland, who's a 40-year politician marketing guy, rhetoric. Yeah. So what we're really looking for is specific people that see our long-term vision uh, the vision of 100 years, and we're picking those people based on it. If you notice, I, we hang around with a lot of younger kids. Well, that's because that's my customer base and that's my employee base. And we stick with the people that we, uh, we truly believe will stick with us the whole, through the whole entire process, through the ups and downs, um, won't just stick with us through the ups, won't just stick with us for money or for fame or something like that. We actually are striving to get people who will stick with us no matter what. Because we see it as a generational business. That this isn't my company, it's her company. I'm just the caretaker right now. And it strikes me that, and I say this with the greatest of uh, uh, admiration, you're a crazy mad scientist and you're a patent farm, yeah. uh, skunk works. I, and I deal, I work with people like that uh, uh, quite often. I've got a few of them that I work with, uh, both in the US and uh, overseas. Um, it strikes me that you, you, you may be able to totally uh, self-fund this with some of the IP that you're going to get under your belt. So can you, I mean, can you just expound on that a little bit? Because it sounds pretty impressive. Yeah, when, we, when me and Belle started this, she was five years old. And you're talking 2013, 12. There really wasn't a market out there yet. So we looked, me and Belle looked at it and said, nobody's going to give us money. We're not from the space industry. We come out of the medical field. Uh, MRI, CT, ultrasound, all the radiology department. So we, we designed Boreas to be bootstrapped all the way to orbit with nobody else's money. Um, I could do my day job and literally pay for the rocket myself. And, and that's why that allows us a little bit of freedom. Go ahead. Um, at five, I said something that actually started this whole entire thing, that one sentence. And it's... I guess it's special to me because if I had known it would turn into this, I probably wouldn't have said it. 
So my dad had told me when we were building bottle rockets in our backyard, I want to build my own rocket. I want to go to space, and I don't want to use someone else's rocket. I want to, I want to have um, my own. I want to go to space. Um, and my five-year-old mind was like, well, sounds like we need to build our own rocket. And that's where all the, this came from. Because we actually had a payload. We have a payload that's ready to go that we need to test in space. It, uh, it's patented. Um, and that's why we built a rocket is for this payload. So as you said, we're, we're a patent farm. Um, what we're, we like to say is the education system builds specialists, and we're generalists. Mm -hmm. We're early adopters. We're going to find the way to do it no matter what. We'll take a solution from the nuclear industry and bring it into rockets. We'll take a rocket industry bring it to the motorcycles.